It wasn't Sarah's fault. I overreacted and I know it. A man of my age should know better. I'm going to apologize after she calms down. I mean, in her defense, who doesn't like pancake faces? Me. That's who. She'd made a perfect bacon mouth, banana and blueberry eyes, then topped it off with a strawberry nose and whipped cream eyebrows. So much effort and attention to detail. It was amazing. I just wish staring down at that face didn't scare the absolute EFF out of me. Sarah wasn't to know. It's not like restrictive food intake disorder came up in our regular conversation. I don't suffer from it now, but when I was a kid, pancake faces were my jam. Some kids only want green foods. Some kids want everything cut into triangles. Some kids won't eat if one food is touching something else on the plate. That wasn't my issue. I wish my disorder was something so vanilla. My father activated my condition not long after I turned three. It was innocent enough when I think about it. My mother was at the hospital having given birth to my new baby sister the day before. It was the men living the bachelor life whilst getting everything ready for their return. We'd been watching television before dinner and something in the show had scared me. He tells me I was inconsolable. I couldn't, no, wouldn't, stop crying. He said he tried all his go-to tricks. Funny faces, peekaboo, even pretending to fall over to make me laugh. The tears wouldn't stop flowing. Like most men, he resorted to food to pacify me. It was almost dinner time, so he fixed me a plate of meatloaf with vegetables. Luckily for him, my mother had our meals prepared ready to heat and eat. I was placed in my high chair and the plate put in front of me. More tears. He pleaded with me to stop to no avail. That's when he had his aha moment. My favorite book at the time was about a farmer feeding his animals. Desperate for silence, my father rearranged my food to look like the front cover. Broccoli trees with carrot trunks. Mashed potato clouds over a field of beans. Meatloaf cut and shaped into a barn. Uncle Joe's farm was right in front of me, presented on my plate. I'm told I stopped crying straight away, transfixed by this masterpiece. That was the moment everything changed for our family for the next two years. I wouldn't eat unless my food was crafted into some kind of artistic vision. All meals received this treatment. My parents indulged it at first because of the tantrums and hunger strikes that followed if they didn't. It got to the point where meal prep was taking hours for our family of four. My little sister was now one but didn't exhibit any of my behaviors. I can look back now and realize, insisting on 3D creations might have gone a bit too far. I was four and a half before starting kindergarten. All the other kids had started when they were four, but my parents were worried I wouldn't do so well with my mealtime disorder. They'd held me back hoping it would fade away. When they finally relented, I was sent to kindergarten with a packed lunch and a list of assembly instructions for my meals. My father got the idea from Ikea when assembling the big boy bed for me. He tells me that they were fortunate enough that I wasn't, perhaps ironically, that much of a fussy eater and was quite content to eat the same meals throughout the week. He'd make up batches of the same meals and freeze them along with structural toothpicks. The kind teachers obliged my routine for a few weeks before requesting all my lunches to come pre-assembled, or I'd have to eat like the rest of the children. Fed up with my requirements, they tried to convince my parents they could cure me of this nuisance affliction for culinary artistry, with a few days of not eating. I'd get hungry soon enough they'd say. If it was going to work, my parents needed to replicate the provisions at home to match their approach. Normal meals or nothing they said. They'll eat when he realizes what they said. They were wrong. I'm told my hunger strike entered day three before the teachers caved and called my father at his office. They informed him that against their better judgment, they'd served me a suitable meal and fed me, but would not be renewing my place next term. They simply didn't have the resources to accommodate someone like his son. This sent my mother into a panic. What she'd understood to be a phase clearly wasn't. Her normal daughter was now eating mashed potato with peas just dolloped on the plate. Her sausages were cut up haphazardly, and the carrot sticks clumped together on the side. They kind of looked like a pile of logs, if I pretended. My sister didn't care. She ate it all up without fuss. The savage. Driven to her wit's end, my mother called the only woman she knew who could help her, my nana. She cried down the phone line outlining what the teachers had threatened. She tried what the doctors had advised and even asked the other mothers at the park, but nothing had worked. My father had even discreetly asked his colleagues for ideas. The accountant offered advice about clean eating but that had no effect either. My nana listened to it all. All the complaints, all the crying, and all the failed approaches. 
My mother fell silent and nodded as she listened. A minute passed then she hung up the phone thanking Nana over and over before turning to face me. Nana had requested to look after me for the weekend. She was going to fix everything. She knew just what to do. Now you have to know, my Nana was the kindest, sweetest old lady that ever lived. She always had a tale to tell and always had candy in her pockets for us. I loved visiting my Nana and Nano but hated it when I had to stay for a visit. We didn't have to stay often but when we did, I begged my parents to take us home instead of staying over. You see, none of the neighborhood kids would play with me or accept my invite to come over and watch television. I wasn't allowed to play at their houses either. It didn't matter what I tried, they were wary of my Nana and I had no idea why. Neighbors crossed the street to walk past her house. Birds didn't nest in her trees and if a ball somehow managed to land in the yard, it was lost to them forever. My Nano used to toss the footballs over the fence but no one would pick them up. It didn't take long for him to stop trying to return the discarded items. He'd either keep them for his grandchildren or throw them in the trash. At 8 a.m. Saturday morning, my mother dropped me off and was gone in a matter of minutes. We waved goodbye to her from the front porch before Nana went inside. I looked at the neighbor's window as the curtains were quickly drawn shut. I was called inside and asked to come to the breakfast table. Everything was laid out for me just how I liked it. The boiled eggs had been sliced at the top and the yolk scooped out, mashed up and replaced to look like a chick hatching from the egg. Nana had used peppercorns for her eyes and carrots for her beak. She pushed bread into a bowl and toasted it so it looked like a nest then set the egg inside. She fussed around me making sure I appreciated the dish before eating it. Nano read his paper at the end of the table drinking his coffee and shaking his head at us. He told her this was ridiculous, and I would grow out of it if left alone. She said something I couldn't understand and he shut up right away. I was sent outside to play in the yard while she cleaned up. Nano came out and tended to the garden as I kicked a ball back and forth against the garden shed. Children's voices laughed in the surrounding yards so I climbed the fence and looked over into one of the neighbor's yards. The children stopped their game and stared at me before their mother ran outside and ushered them into the house. She looked back at me, made a sign of the cross, and then slammed the back door while muttering under her breath. Nano laughed at the sound of the door slamming and told me to get down and help him with the vegetables. As I dropped down, my shirt caught on something and tore a small hole over my chest. I showed the hole to Nano and he explained it wouldn't stop me from gardening. I wanted to know why the lady next door said Nana had an itch. It didn't make sense to me. He told me some people believe everything they hear, and I should focus on the garden. He showed me how to check the tomatoes, when to dig up the potatoes, and how to identify the weeds. It wasn't long before Nana was calling us inside for lunch. We washed our hands and came into the kitchen to eat. Instead of another masterpiece waiting for me, we had been served bologna sandwiches. Ordinary sandwiches. Nothing fancy, nothing artistic. Plain. Old. Bologna. Sandwiches. I looked at my nana and then at the plate. My sandwich was served on the round plastic plates reserved for my baby sister and young cousins. She knew I ate off white plates like the big kids, I'd eaten off one at breakfast. Nano sat down at his sandwich without complaint. He informed Nana of the tear in my shirt before picking up his sandwich. He scoffed it down in a few bites and requested another before taking up his coffee. Nana fixed him another sandwich as I sat there staring at the monstrosity before me. It was hideous. No flair, no presentation, just meat slapped between two pieces of bread. I complained but was instructed to eat. It wasn't the food that bothered me, I loved bologna sandwiches. I just didn't want this bologna sandwich. It was boring and plain. I needed something more. I wanted a bunch of strawberry roses. I needed broccoli trees with pomegranate seed apples. I craved a pineapple chunk, yellow brick road. The standoff began. Nano polished off two sandwiches and began eyeing off mine. Nana ignored me for a few minutes as she pottered about the house. She stopped by and asked if I was interested in eating yet. I shook my head so she slid the plate to Nano and he gobbled it up. She ripped a sheet of paper from the pad next to the refrigerator and handed it to her husband with some instructions of specific stores he was to visit. He got up, pulled on his coat and kissed us goodbye before leaving me with Nana and the two empty plates. Nana took my shirt off and made me follow to her sewing room. She told me I wasn't allowed to watch television and if I got bored, I was to read a book or play outside. But first, I had to sit there as she mended my shirt. She explained to me that when she was a little girl, 
food wasn't purchased from the store. If you wanted a meal, you cooked it as a family. There was no buying ingredients and putting them together. No buying bread from the baker or fruit from the grocer. Her family grew their own food and even kept farm animals. She explained that's why she still had chickens and Nano grew the biggest and best tomatoes, better than you could buy in any supermarket. It wasn't until they came to this country did she discover the supermarket and how easy they made it to acquire the provisions for dinner. Families passed down traditions for their recipes and how to make the perfect dish your neighbors would envy. Her neighbors never accepted her food anymore so she stopped trying to make things for them. Now she focused on feeding Nano and her grandchildren. She explained that the perfect meal could change a person's mind if it was prepared just right. Good, honest food was so powerful, it could make a person stop talking. They would think of nothing else but the food in front of them until it was all gone. Nana had been taught all the family secrets and today, she was going to cook a special meal for me. She handed me my shirt and sent me outside instructing me not to come back until Nano returned. I resumed kicking the ball for a few minutes before becoming bored. My stomach grumbled but I knew there was no way Nana would prepare me something I'd like to eat. I visited the chicken coop then inspected the vegetable garden to see if any of the tomatoes had ripened yet. Nano soon returned and I helped him carry the shopping inside. We got everything on the bench before being sent to my room for an afternoon nap. When I woke, we would make dinner together and she would teach me the family secrets. It didn't take long to fall asleep and even less time to wake because of my empty stomach. I wandered down the hall rubbing my eyes. I stopped by the bathroom then went to find Nana. The kitchen had been transformed in a way I'd never seen before. The blinds had been drawn and there were candles all over the room. Nana called me over to see what was happening. She had gathered the ingredients for dinner onto the kitchen bench and we were going to cook an old family recipe, Tagliatelle. This recipe was only cooked for very special occasions and only when it was requested by someone else. The details weren't known to the men of the family. This recipe was passed down to the women but today, there was going to be a small exception. I wasn't to breathe a word of it to anyone and if asked, I was never to reveal how it was made. She measured the perfect amount of flour onto the bench and shaped it to make a small well in the middle. She showed me how to crack the eggs into the well and add the olive oil, water, and salt. She talked to herself as she mixed the dough and although I couldn't understand what she was saying, the words sounded like a song. She asked me if I knew what it meant to keep a secret and I nodded. She asked me to fetch three glass bottles from a wooden box on the table and bring them to her. She pulled the small cork from the first bottle and poured out some drops of blue liquid and mixed it in. Nana showed me how to knead the dough and then prep it for rest. We set it aside and repeated the process again, this time adding red drops from the second bottle and green drops from the third. She carefully put the bottles back in the wooden box and closed it. We talked while the dough rested and Nana started preparing the sauce. My stomach yearned for the food to be cooked and served up to me. The smells were making me dizzy. Nana asked me to test the sauce as it was an important part of meal preparation. Without realizing, I gave in and licked the sauce from the wooden spoon. It was glorious. We had three pots on the boil ready for the colored tagliatelle. Nano had set the table and was cutting bread to accompany the meal. He set up olive oil for the bread then poured two glasses of wine. The candlelight danced across the walls and I took deep inhalations listening to an old record playing from the family room. Nana tasted the tagliatelle and declared it perfect. She strained it separately to avoid it being mixed together before instructing me to take my seat at the table. Nano placed some fresh basil on the table and took his place as well. We waited patiently as Nana had her back turned to us and plated our meals. The smells were too much for my little stomach. Nano swayed his hands to the music and closed his eyes waiting to be served. The first thing I noticed was the plates, I was eating off the adult plates again. Nana served her husband and kissed his head before putting her dish down as well. The dish was something I'd never seen before. My mother had never cooked anything like this and it made me wonder if she knew this recipe. The colored strands were intertwined into a ball in the center of the plate, with sauce holding them together like glue. Nana retrieved my plate and placed it in front of me before taking her seat. She was a magician. She'd arranged the strands into what almost looked like a painting. There was no sauce on my plate, but I didn't care. I was looking at a perfect replica of Nano's vegetable garden as seen from the kitchen window. The green stalks held red tomatoes with a blue sky to finish the piece. Nana watched me admire the plate while Nano started eating his dinner. I couldn't eat mine. My stomach grumbled at being in such close proximity to proper food, but my hands were fixed to my lap. 
I looked at my Nano, but he was ignoring me as he stuffed food into his mouth. Nana wasn't watching me either. She twirled her fork between the colored strands on her plate and gently brought them to her mouth. The candlelight somehow stopped its rapid dancing and began swaying back and forth in time with the music. The flames got bigger causing the shadows on the wall to grow and reach to the ceiling. The music got louder as the shadows battled to overtake the light from the candles. My grandparents were oblivious to our surroundings and ate in silence between sips of wine. I hadn't yet taken a bite of my meal. I put it down to being too transfixed by the image of the vegetable garden. That's when I noticed something had changed. In the time it had taken to look away from the plate and check on my grandparents, one of the tomatoes had fallen off its stalk and lay on the bottom of the plate. I thought for sure I must have missed this detail, but as I watched, another tomato dropped off the stalk. Within a few seconds, the stalks were bare and the tomatoes began to turn brown. I tried to call Nana, but nothing would come out. The rest of the strands twisted and contorted before shifting across the plate. Their pace increased as they arranged themselves into a new image. I watched my mother and father getting into our car with my sister. They were waving goodbye to me then driving away. The car got smaller before the strands morphed into something new. Tears were rolling down my face. I couldn't look away from the plate and still couldn't move my hands. Now my family stood at our house with their new son to replace me. They looked so happy as they played together. Scene after scene unfolded and I was completely unable to look away. Nana and Nano didn't say a word or even acknowledge what was happening. They were oblivious to my sobbing and unfazed by their surroundings. The shadows somehow managed to get bigger and the candle's flame was now almost touching the ceiling. I wept as the dish formed more and more horrific scenes before returning to the original image of the vegetable garden. It was finished. It had to be over. I tried moving my arms and turning away but nothing worked. The strands were still but the shadows in the room started circling around the walls as the music got faster and the flames got even bigger. Nano entered the scene and walked to his tomatoes. He inspected them like he taught me earlier and started putting ripe ones into his basket before clutching his chest. He collapsed onto the garden bed as his wife ran over to him. She fell to her knees and shook him, but he wouldn't move. Despite my screaming, no one paid me any attention. They just ate in silence. I had to watch as Nana picked up a shovel and covered her husband with dirt. She walked away leaving his basket of tomatoes strewn across the garden bed. For the first time since sitting down, I managed to close my eyes. The music stopped so I opened my eyes to find the room had returned to normal. The candle was back to its regular size and the shadows had disappeared. My legs shifted allowing me to jump from my chair back and run to my bedroom. Nano followed me and asked what was wrong. He rubbed the hair from my face and wiped my tears with the handkerchief as he listened to me explain all the horrors I'd seen on the plate. After settling me down, he persuaded me to come back to the table and finish my meal. I made him promise nothing bad would happen before agreeing to go back. He carried me down the hallway and sat me back at the table. My food had been transferred into a bowl and stirred around before being covered with the sauce. Nana had put a fork into the dish and placed some bread next to the bowl for me. Nothing was said about my ordeal and we all ate the rest of the meal in silence. When we finished eating, I was sent to watch TV. Nano washed up while Nana scraped the leftovers into a green container then put them into the fridge. I was tucked in bed not long after that but I remember not being able to fall asleep for a long time. My parents arrived to pick me up the next morning and couldn't believe it when they saw me in the kitchen eating scrambled eggs on toast. Scrambled eggs. Nothing fancy, nothing artistic. Plain, old, scrambled, eggs. My mother kissed my head as I ate breakfast. When it was time to leave, Nana took my hand and walked me out to the car. Nano was back in his garden and waved to us before placing a fresh tomato in his basket. My father got me and my sister belted in as my mother talked with Nana. She handed the green container to my mother and said something I couldn't hear. They both looked back at me, then turned their attention to the container. Nana spoke and my mother pulled the container tight to her chest while nodding. They exchanged hugs and kisses before Nana came to my door and opened it. She leaned in and reminded me about my promise. I told her I wouldn't say a word and she smiled at me before turning to look at Nano. I looked over her shoulder and the sky went dark. We both watched as Nano reached up and clutched at his heart. Just like the night before, I couldn't look away. Nano grimaced and bit his bottom lip before falling to one knee. He hit himself in the chest with his fist and tried to catch his breath. About 30 seconds had passed before he stood up and took some deep breaths. 
He massaged his chest before taking out his handkerchief and wiping his brow. The sky went back to normal and Nano went back to the garden. Before I could scream, Nana turned back to face me. She pressed a finger to her lips and gave me a wink. Pulling a tissue from her apron, she wiped the sweat from my face and brushed my hair out of my eyes. She inspected my face, turning it left and right before giving my chin a quick squeeze. Satisfied, she closed the car door and took a step back and waved as my father started the car and drove us home. 